Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA card for uh, Saturday, August 6th. And it's a small card, uh, 12 fights. And usually what that means is that you're less uh, you're less greedy about the, the points you want to get from your wins. Uh, usually you have these big 14 fight cards. There's going to be a whole bunch of combinations that are six for six. And you really have to make sure to get like top six scorers. And like, you just, you need to make sure that your, that, that your, your fighter is going to get a hundred points plus. But when you're in a 12 fight slate, um, you don't, you're not as greedy about, um, about how much you need from your wins. I mean, win equity matters a lot. Um, now that's not to say that I wouldn't rather have, you know, a big high scoring guy than a low scoring guy, but don't, don't uh, don't be upset if you, if you pay, take an eighty three hundred dollar fighter who, who gets the W and gets a, a decision for you know seventy seventy five points. Um, even even in the you know the big uh, GPP. Now I will say that you know the other thing about a twelve fight slate is that it's it becomes a little less likely that someone can take the thing down by themselves. Um, so just go into that with some, ex, you know, with, with those types of expectations that it's, you know, it's going to be unlikely that, that if you, no matter how many lines you put in, well, it doesn't matter how many lines you put in, it's very, very uh, unlikely that there's going to be a unique lineup that takes this down, but Hey, but who knows? Um, there are going to be some really, really low owned spots here that if they, you know, they, they, they put a string together, uh, you know, you can, um, uh, you put a string together. You could get a unique lineup, but we're talking about some pretty low uh, low probability outcomes here. But these fights are are very instructive uh, and and very thought provoking. Uh, these fights, and I want to get right into it. And let's start with the first fight: uh, Egger against uh, Bueno Silva. And already you have a very uh, classic situation here of of a really really good play. So you have pricing: who is Bueno Silva at eighty two hundred, and Egger is eight k. But when you look at the, the fight odds, you'll see that Edgar is actually a minus 130, or maybe up to a minus 150 favorite in some spots. Um, this, this, all the money has basically come in on Edgar since the, since the original DraftKings pricing was released, which is why you have this imbalance. So you have some natural win equity in play the Edgar side of this fight. Um, in addition to that, uh, the, the most recent form of Egger seems to indicate that that her style is is very conducive to to high drafting scoring. I mean, she has finishes, she has grappling and takedown upside. So um, this is a very very strong play uh, coming right right off the bat. I imagine she'll be somewhat popular, um, but uh, again, uh, we're we're not focusing as much on that uh, in in this video. Uh, but Egger certainly is is it an extremely strong play and i would probably start my lineups with her i mean just you don't get that type of of uh, of win equity uh, that often and on a 12 fight slate as i mentioned in the in the intro to this win equity is a big deal on a slate like this so um i, I do like egger quite a bit uh now again you're, you're not talking about any kind of lock here i mean she's only you know win the fight about 55 percent of the time but you have that combination of being underpriced uh, plus having grappling and, and, you know, a decent upside in her wins. So I think this is a really, really strong play coming right out of the bat, right out of the gate. So this next fight is, is, is really, really interesting because I want to kind of compare this to some others. So you have Corey McKenna against Miranda Granger. And if you look at the price here, you see Corey McKenna, you know, bad a two to one favorite, maybe 225 and Miranda Granger on the other side, maybe 175, 180. Okay. And you look at this, I want to show you the pricing here. You have McKenna at 9,100 and Granger at 7,100. And I want you to think about that for a second. There are other fights on this card with similar pricing where the win odds is not nearly as close. Okay. Like for example, uh, let's look at, well, Let's take a look at uh, Jamal Hill. Like this is the main event for openers. You have Jamal Hill who's a minus 300 favorite. Okay. Uh, 240 on the comeback. And that pricing is, is even is, is about the same. It's like 9,700, you know, and, and then you have, let's look at some others. You have, um, 
look at um look at pagua pagua is is paga is a minus 265 right minus 220 on the comeback or whatever it is much bigger favorite than 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 great than uh, mckenna but that pricing you see is 8,900, 7,300. It's even, it's, it's tighter. It goes on and on. You have um, even Spivak. He's a, he's a minus 275, which is a bigger favorite than McKenna. Not to mention that Spivak has, you know, probably more upside. And Spivak is only, let's take a look. And Spivak is only 8,800. You know, so um, uh, that's something different. Am I okay? Um, let's look at some others. I mean, look at even Olaze Chuck and Alvi. Olaze Chuck is a minus 600 favorite, and and while he's a little more expensive, I mean, not that much. You have Olaze Chuck is 9,300. I mean, he's only 200 more pretty much than 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 McKenna. Um, so th this is a weird fight because. I think McKenna has is just has very very poor relative value, like to some of these other favorites. Um, and 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 likewise, you know, the unfortunate reality is that Granger at seventy one hundred is is a pretty well pretty well uh, well priced uh, two to one hundred dog. Um, you know, you just see that some of these other other dogs who have less of a chance to win are being priced higher. So, relative to the other underdogs on a slate where you, you need some kind of win equity. Um, Granger is actually pretty good value. Now, again, if you, if you, if you read all the narratives, I mean, it's going to be tough to play her because, you know, Corey McKenna has all this hype behind her and you almost like think that the UFC wants her to win. And then you have Granger coming off a two year layoff after having been pregnant and having a child and raising a child for a year. You know, it's, it's these types of situations usually don't turn out too well for the returning fighter. Um, but to, it's in some sense, you have to have some faith in, in the, in Vegas, right? I mean, she supposedly is only a two to one underdog and she's being priced at 7,100. Um, I think in the long run, you're supposed to play fighters like this, especially when you're really starved for other good underdogs. Um, unless those other underdogs that we, you know, that I alluded to have just incredible upside. Um, to overcome the the relatively poor win equity compared to Granger, I think Granger is probably a, a better play than the underdogs in the fights that I just kind of brought up. Um, now, again, she doesn't really have takedown upside. She doesn't have that type of, you know, uh, look, it's women's MMA so that she can always get a finish. You know, it's, you never know what can happen there. But like I said, I mean, if she, even she she squeaks out at just an impossible decision and gets 65 or something. I mean, I think it's 7,100. I think that's really, really strong, considering that there are going to be some real expensive fighters with incredible ceilings that you do want to get access to. So if you get get somehow body English a win out of Granger somehow, I mean you're in really, really good shape, um, say the least. Um, I will also say going into this card that I do think that it's possible that the winning lineup does have a loser on this. Um, I don't think that Granger fits the bill though. Um, cause again, she doesn't have that, she doesn't have that type of, 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 of style where she's going to rack up points, even in losses, she's going to probably use her reach advantage, reach edge to her, reach advantage to her advantage and keep McKenna from taking her down and just kind of frustrate her a little bit and just win a close decision. But it's a tough decision to win, you know, when, when you have a situation like, like McKenna, where they really want to get home here. But then again, I mean, you could have said the same thing about McKenna's last fight against um elise reed and elise reed outstruck her and then got the win um so this is a really interesting fight um I, I as far as mckenna goes so because of everything that i just said she's probably going to be low owned um and she does have grappling upside so so if you play her i mean you really need to have you know get that big ownership discount because she's not going to project as well as some of these other favorites. Okay. Even with her grappling upside. I mean, even like, listen, if she doesn't get a finish, uh, I guess she could get 90 or something like that. 
but she was supposed to be able to take down Elise Reed. You know what I mean? She wasn't able to do that. I don't know. Maybe she's just, maybe it's just kind of, kind of fraudulent. I don't know. So uh, I would check back for ownership and, and I would really only play McKenna in deep field stuff. I mean, really would um, just the, the, the win equity is just, just so poor relative to these other fighters, which we'll get to. All right. Um, next fight, uh, Quinlan versus Jason Witt. This, this is probably, uh, I would say the fight that is the, uh, is, is the fight that you probably want to lock in if you had to lock in any fight. Um, and, and the reason for that is both fighters win condition is extremely, uh, conducive to strong scoring you know Qu Quinlan is a knockout guy and and Jason Witt has been knocked out quite a bit I mean you, you look at the inside the distance line at minus 200 um it, it, it's 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 even it's even worse than that the reason why is because all of the basically finishing upside is in Quinlan like Quinlan he he's plus 110 just himself to win by TK right so about half the time he wins by KO and on a 12 fight slate, you can, if you get a KO, you're, you're, in, you're in good shape here at only 80, at, what is he? 8,600. Um, yeah. So this is a tough style situation here. You have Quinlan who's a knockout guy and Wynn who gets knocked out a bit. So um, this is um, the Quinlan side is extremely live. And the Jason Witt side is also extremely live because the reason why that, inside the distance prop is all favorite Quinlan is Jason Witt's win condition is not really about finishing. His win condition is employing his wrestling. And that is literally the only way that he's been winning. Um, and we haven't really seen Quinlan um, deal with wrestling yet. He's been off for 10 months after getting to, you know, testing positive for steroids. So who knows how he comes back from that. And, you know, is, is win going to, is Witt going to win? Probably not because he is a two to one underdog, but in those 33% of the, of the fights that he wins, I mean, it's going to be because he gets takedowns. And he gets takedowns at 7,600. That's exactly what you want. Um, is that what he is, 7,600 or 7,800? 7,600. So this is a extremely important fight to get into your lineups. Um, if you're playing two lineups, uh, you definitely need one of each. If you're playing, I think, 10 lineups, I think you need five of each. I think that you should can almost lock this in up to 50 lineups. I really, I really believe that. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's that. The next fight here, you have battle versus Sato. Um, let's, let's look at the numbers for a minute. Look at once again, you have a minus 260, minus 260 favorite, you know, um, he's being priced relatively reasonably. I mean, these minus 265 is usually are like 9k. You know, or something like that. So battles win odds are pretty, pretty reasonable. And Sato's underdog odds are not, you know, I mean, I guess they're okay. They're not, they're not great though. Um, I would expect them to be closer to maybe 7,200, 7,300. What is he? 7,400. Let's take a look at the inside the distance line here. I mean, the fight doesn't go to the decision line is actually pretty poor as well. So it, it's, it's a, it's basically a pick them. Um, you do have battle with, as a plus 275 by submission. So maybe, I don't know, but you look at Sato, and this is where I want to look to, to get to get at here. Sato wins. I want to see Sato by KO. Hold on. Sato by unanimous. So Sato wins in round three. Sato wins by decision. Sato wins inside the distance. Sato winning inside the distance is plus 380. Um, well, cutting the juice in half there. So five, five to one. So I would say, so it's, that means about 20% of the time Sato gets a KO and at his price of 7,400, I think that's very reasonable, you know? Um, and, and, and on a, on a fight card where you're really, really need to find some decent underdogs. I think that, I think that he is live. Um, I don't, I just, for, for battle, I just, as we'll get to, they're just guys with better win, not better win conditions, but better upside than him. So he's probably going to be on, you know, if I play, if I max enter, he'll, 
he'll be I'll be well under on him. And it's gonna take me many lineups before I get to him, I think, in this uh in this construction. You know, Battle is coming off of this uh uh whatchamacallit, the ultimate fighter stuff, which is pretty much a theme of this. And I have not been particularly impressed with the performance of these guys. Like you had this guy Tercios that came off of that that series like two weeks ago and he was supposed to be the nuts and everybody played him and he was off. You know what I mean? Like, like there's a big difference between these, these, I think between these UFC fighters and these, these other, these other series fighters, which is one of the reasons why this Quinlan wit fight could be somewhat fishy. You know, he has Quinlan. He's, he's been beating up these other lower level guys, but you know, it's just different in the UFC. So if Quinlan it's minus 200 against for his first shot in the UFC, that's rough business. And likewise, I don't know how good battle is really. You know? So I don't know. I think Sato is certainly live as an underdog. Here. All right. So McKinney Gonzalez. So this is what I'm talking about now. Now McKinney in, in, in fairness is 9,500, right? So this is a very, very difficult price to pay. However, like his, um, he's minus like a thousand, you know, or minus 900. But, and not only that, he, he's, the fight is minus 250 to finish inside of one and a half rounds. As a matter of fact, it's like, you'd have to lay money for it to, if you want, if you were going to bet on it to go to round two. I mean, this is, this is, this is a fight that if you could somehow get to McKinney, you're going to have to try it because he could, this is the type of guy that could put up a hundred, you know, he could win the fight in, in 30 seconds and get the, and get the 60, 60 second bonus and put up 130 fantasy points. And on a 12 fight slate, that's, you're just not beating that. You know what I mean? Like, like that, those are the types of constructions where the 130 ends up getting paired with a losing like for example, a Jason Witt loss. You know, Jason Witt gets a couple of takedowns, then he gets KO'd and gets like 35 fantasy points anyway, or something like that. That, that those are and when you have that 130 in your pocket, it's so big on a 12 fight slate. So while it's tough to pay the 9,500, there's no denying that type of upside. And, and there's and, and and the fact is that if you're thinking of playing um what's your what's your name? Um, uh, Corey McKenna, you're just going to have to find the 400 and, and get up to McKinney. You know what I mean? Like, what's the difference between, for example, like if you were going to play uh, McKinney and some 7,800 fighter, I mean, is it really that much different? The, the difference between the 7,800 and the 7,400 fighter? Probably not. So, so I would, I would, I think McKinney is something you really need to get to. Um, there's another guy that we'll get to later, which doesn't look exactly the same, but pretty close. But this is going to be the theme of this card is, is how to get to these big upside guys because they're probably going to score through the roof, you know. Um, when it, with, with respect to Eric Gonzalez, um, his side of it, can he win? Yeah, I guess. Um, he's going to win it only, though, about, like I said, about, what's that, 12% of the time. And unfortunately, even at 6,800, that's not a very good price. You know, so so this is um so this is either a McKinney or a pass. And then you have uh Ola Zaychuk against Aldi. And here's another one where you have um uh, the next big payup option here. Uh Albi is sixty nine hundred and Ola Zaychuk is ninety three hundred. Um we'll look at the at the odds and again it's a minus six hundred favor. I mean that's 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 enormous. I mean who would why would you play McKenna? Right. Unless you knew that in all of her wins, she was scoring 100, you know, which is just not the case. Uh, you know, Ola Chuck is just, you know, much, much bigger favorite. And, you know, there's been rumors that Sam Alvey, this is his last fight. I could I could just see him kind of throwing him in the towel, throwing in the towel pretty early here. And you get a first round KO from Ola Chuck. I mean, you're uh, <laughs> you're in business, right? Um the, the, the interesting thing, though, is the fight doesn't go to a decision line. looks pretty low. I mean, it's it's only minus 175. Um, as a matter of fact, let's take a look at the Ola Zaychuk side of it. Um, Ola Zaychuk by TKO is minus 110. Or by submission, plus 110. 
OSH on inside the distance minus 125. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not much of an MMA better, but to me, that kind of seems like a lock. I don't know. I've heard, I, listen, I have heard, you know, um, whatchamacallit, uh, I have heard narratives that Sam Alvey does does slow down and creates slow fights. I, I guess, you know, um, but I don't know. You give me a minus 600 favorite against the dude who's just, you know, kind of on the way out. Um, I don't know why. I, I, I think that Ola can said this is probably really strong. And, and if he's going to be low, not going to be low, but if he's going to be, say, that much lower owned than, say, I don't know, Hill or – or, or McKinney for that matter, you know, just because of that narrative of, of, of and not because of the narrative, just because the inside of distance prop is pretty poor, right? I mean, it's not really that great. If he somehow is low owned here. I, th I think he's going to be a good play, you know? Um, so I think all his A check again, he's, he's, he's another spend up that you, that you really kind of want to get to. And at the very least, I mean, I, I, sir, I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put a little bit of all his A check inside the distance that this, uh, if Alvi really wants to stand there and take like one more beating, that's fine. I think he's going to cower up eventually and just give up. So that's, that's, that's my opinion. Uh, again, DFS is not usually, you know, giving my opinion on the fight. I don't like to think that I have that much of an edge on Vegas, but sometimes, yeah, listen, those you've been following over the last year or two, I've been pretty, pretty good with those, with those leans as rarely as I give them. So um, I like this one. Oze Chuck, at least un inside the distance over Alvi and probably play it in DFS also. Uh, and I'm not going to get to any Alvi at all. Okay, uh, Lipsky against Kachu Um, So I think that this fight is going to get a, a little bit over and, and And the reason why is because Kachu she has this reputation and it's well earned for just always just sticking her face out, just just not minding getting the crap kicked out of her. And, 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 just get into a slug match. And and usually fights like that um are pretty uh are pretty uh are pretty volatile. And volatile fights is what you want in DFS. Um, but let's take a look at the inside the distance prop. It's actually not bad. Mm. It's like almost a pick 'em, isn't it? You don't see that in women's fights. You can also get an under two and a half rounds for plus one forty. Boy, oh boy, do I have to? Do I have to do this? Do I have to bet fight doesn't go to decision at plus one thirty? Well, what's better to play that or to play the fight uh, in DFS? Because the thing is, is that yeah, I'm gonna have to play this. Aren't how cheap these guys, these these women are. Lipsky's eighty four hundred and Catch Wear is seven eight hundred. And you have the two of these 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 gals just banging at each other. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe you're supposed to play this fight after all. Maybe that's why people are going to play it. So yeah. So so I, I've actually changed my mind as I'm talking through this. I do think that you should play this. That that this fight is definitely some uh, fight you should be playing. Um, and I think either of these girls is is really really live. I mean, it's going to be because Cachoeira you know presses the pace. And I've heard some stories that okay, Lipsky, if she just keeps in distance, she's better off. It does it, listen, it doesn't work that way. Okay. If Tatuera wants to get in, get in there and turn into a ball, she's just going to. She might end up getting her face beat in as a result of it, but Lipsky's not going to be able to just like dance around here. This is not this is not boxing. I'm telling you. This is if, if one fighter really wants to turn into a freaking to a fiesta, that's what's gonna be. Um and uh, as a result, I think Lipsky's live. I think Cachoeira is always live. And uh, I think this is a pretty decent fight. All right. Uh, Spivak versus Sakai. I'm probably going to make the wrong decision here. But let's let's talk about this for a second. So Spivak is a minus 250 favorite. And he's only 8,700. Which is, which is, first of all, that in and of itself is, is, is pretty good, right? For 8,800. But the other thing is that Spivak is a takedown machine. Okay. He he in his very last fight, he took uh, took down Hardy, grounded, pounded him. His fight before that. I mean, like he has a lot of of ability to get good draft king scoring by taking guys down. And Sakai apparently is, does not have the greatest takedown defense in the world. Okay. 
So you have a win condition on top of of good win odds on Spivak. And boy, oh boy, he's someone, again, that can get this done in the first round, maybe. You know, and not only the first round, he could take the guy down and then just ground and pound him for the rest of the round, rack up some more points there, and, and, and get like 120. I mean, it's definitely possible. However, and this, that's what I was originally going to do. I was originally going to lock in speed back and then, you know, and then just kind of like play a little bit of all, all the other favorites that I liked and, and just, and, and play some Egger and all this stuff. I was originally just going to go down with the ship with, with spin back. And then, you know, I, I started thinking and I guess thinking is a bad thing, but from what I've heard about Sakai, I mean, he's, 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 was just, he's literally no worse than Spivak, but Sakai's just had tougher matchups recently. And, you know, you get a guy like that at plus two to one, um, it, and on a, on a card where you need underdogs, uh, you probably should do it. And, and the thing is, is that if Spivak does not get the takedowns, then Sakai is very live, you know, and, and he's live for a decision. He's live for a KO. Um, so unfortunately, I am gonna have to play some of Sakai. Now, now with that said, Spivak does remain probably the best play on the slate. Now that I think about it, given all the price tags and everything, I think he sort of has to be. But the, the only thing I have to say is that ownership might get flooded there. No, I, I, I think that the ownership on Spivak is going to be high. Is it going to be too high? I don't know, maybe. Maybe Spivak's not the best player in this league, but but he's certainly one of them. Um, so uh, I guess I think in your first lineup you should you should play him. I think probably in your first five lineups you should play him. You know whatever. Um, but I'm going to start sprinkling some Sakai into my underdog pool um, as uh, um, as I as I extend my lineup uh, my lineups. Um, let's look at the um, so the price is eighty eight hundred seventy four hundred. Let's look at the inside the distance prop, by the way. Um, yeah, the inside, it's minus 200, you know, and that, so they, so he's got KO and, and submission upside, but not only that, I mean, he's, um, he could also get multiple takedowns and win a decision with 120 points. You know what I mean? Like it's, everything's in Spivak's favor here, except the fact that maybe he's just not that good, you know? And, and so my underdog pool is going to include Sakai on the idea that maybe he's not that good. And, and he does, you know, he is a minus 270, but I do think there's a little bit of recency bias baked into that because Sakai's lost three in a row and Spivak just came off of, of, of a pounding where he pounded somebody. So, uh. all right, Zach Pagwa against Usman, uh, 2,500 versus two, uh, excuse me, minus 250 versus plus 200. Again, uh, you have these price tags where uh, you have, Pagua is oh we skip one oh we'll go back to it. Uh, Pagua is eighty nine hundred. Uh, I guess that's pretty fair. Usman seventy three hundred. I guess it's somewhat fair. But we'll look at the inside the distance prop for the purposes of taking Pagua, and it is um, uh, it's I guess I would say poor. I mean minus one fifty, um, plus one ten for eighty nine hundred. He would have to be really low owned for me to take a shot at him. Um, I. You really at eighty nine hundred. I mean, how how do I play that over spin that? I I don't think I can do it. You know, um, play them both, but I think Pogba is going to be on the outside looking in. It just doesn't look like he's a first round knockout guy. And eighty nine hundred, that's kind of what I want. At least have a chance for a first round knockout. I don't know. And Usman just seems like a fairly priced guy who's not you know particularly intriguing one way or the other. Um, if I want to play a 7,100 fighter, I'll play a, a – what's her name? A Granger, who's more likely to win, you know? Um, that's 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 where I'm looking at this fight. Okay, so the next uh, – the other – that was the, the male, um, whatchamacallit, uh, Ultimate Fighter Championship. The female one is Brogan Walker versus Juliana Miller. And unfortunately, I made the mistake of watching some tape on these fighters. I really shouldn't be doing that. I should let the experts do that. But but this fight kind of intrigued me. I'll give you my findings in a minute. So Juliana Miller is minus 120. So I presume that means she's going to be probably, she should be about 
300 or something. Yeah, so she is 83 versus Walker 7900. So there's no win equity here. I guess Miller has the upside because she has the grappling upside. Um, she actually is a grappler per se. Um, but I have to say, I mean, I watched some of her fights. I mean, I don't know. She's she looks she's fine, I guess. I'm I'm probably inclined to just just fade this fight. I mean, I will say that if I play anybody, it's probably gonna be Miller. But I don't know. I saw even her win. I mean, she basically let somebody fall on her and she got an arm bar. It's weird with these submission these submission fighters, like these pure grapplers that that just go for submissions because she's not really a wrestler. She's like a grappler. She like gets in these clenches and goes for goes for submissions. Those are that's rough. It's hard to rack up points that way unless you get the submission. So she's probably going to be, you know, at one fifty max. I'll get to her, but I don't think I'm going to play this fight until I get to at least twenty lineups, maybe more. Um. Okay, so two more fights left. We have uh, Luke versus Jeff Neal. Uh, 8,500 versus 7,700. Let's take a look at the numbers here. And it's uh, a pretty fairly priced uh, fight. 180 versus 155. Take a look at the uh, inside the distance lines. It's um, it's not bad. I mean, it's not great. It's not bad. Um, let's take a look at, the, at where it comes from. You have Luke plus 240. By TKO, Neil plus three fifty. That's that's totally reasonable, you know. So this particular fight, I feel, is a um, what you might call it is 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 it is a twenty max or more thing, you know. I, I think that the inside of distance prop is okay, um, but I will what I will say is that I would probably have as much Jeff Neil as I would Luke, right? Because Luke's inside the distance prop is plus two fifty, and and Neil's plus three fifty. That's not that much of a difference. And I think the price kind of kind of makes up for that. And I think Jeff Neal is going to be somewhat low owned because he really hasn't performed all that well recently. He got a really, really close decision. Uh, he was in a, he was also in a main event against Stephen Thompson. And he was really poor in that. Um, and Luke, everybody likes Luke. Um, and, uh, but similar to the fight we talked about earlier, if Luke wants to turn this into a brawl and there's not much Neil can do about it, but Neil's pretty, Neil's a pretty good boxer. You know, he could, he could probably stick him a little bit, and who knows? Maybe Neil can get a win. Maybe he can get a get a knockout. I don't know. So, so Neil is going to make my underdog pool, and Luke is going to make my my player pool, but only outside of twenty max. I don't have this fight as as a key fight. And then you have the main event, which is uh, Jamal Hill versus Tiago Santos, and um, you know you got a minus three hundred favorite out of Jamal Hill. And the thing is that there are other there are other ways they can win. So first of all, fight doesn't go to the decision line is minus four fifty. That's that's pretty um, that's pretty grim. You know what I mean? That this fight ain't finishing. And, and and as a matter of fact, it's plus one sixty five to finish. I mean, it's to 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 start round two. I mean, thirty three percent of the time this finishes in the first round. But not only that, I mean. He's going to also pick up a bunch of, of volume along the way. The only thing that 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 Hill is not going to probably get is a lot of takedowns. Um, so when you, you're playing Hill, you are probably playing him for that KO. But I think the inside the distance prop is is strong enough to to support that. Um, so I think that he's very legitimate favorite, very legitimate spend up along right alongside of Owen Zaychuk, right alongside of Terrence McKinney. Um, and right alongside of Sergey Spivak. Um, with respect to Santos, I don't know. He's plus 240. I mean, who else is plus 240? Um, uh, I'd probably rather play Granger, who's a plus 170, who's 7,100. And the only difference is, again, in, in a five-round fight, you know, Santos is going to probably score them. You know what I mean? Um, and in, yeah, listen, he does have some KO upside also. Am I going to play him? At all, probably. I mean, probably. Not. I mean, I may, maybe I'll I'll put put a couple of shares in. If I play one fifty just for the hell of it, but uh, I don't. I just don't. I just don't see this one. Uh, plus two forty. Um, I don't know. I mean, he's he puts on. Listen, he, he tries to go for his KO, and then after that, I mean, 
He's not going to win. Listen, I don't think he's going to score well in a decision. I don't think, I don't, honestly, I don't even think he'll win a decision. So you're really only playing him for his KO upside, which is, let's see. Let's see, uh, Santos by KO. Plus 400, right? Um, 20% of the time he knocks him out. Is that good? Yeah, I guess. I, I guess I have to, right? So if I'm going to play, for example, if I'm going to play Sato, right? Let's take a look at Sato. Let's, let's compare these guys. So they're uh, very close in odds, right? And you have Sato. Fight doesn't, uh, Sato wins by in this inside the distance is what? Sato wins, well, by TKO is 400. Um, let me just see something. Oh, Sato wins inside the distance plus 380, as opposed to Sato, uh, Santos wins inside the distance of, where is it? Same thing, plus 380. So they're the same. I guess that I should play Santos also, right? I guess so. Um, I, I just got to prove that to myself. And considering that that Santos does have five rounds to work with, um, yeah. So I think Santos should. I guess. I guess I've just proven that Santos should be in my pool pretty much as much as uh, as Sato. The only thing I would say is that Sato's probably going to be lower owned than Santos because the people always do like to play the main event underdog. So yeah. So it's it's good I went over this because uh, I wouldn't have played Santos otherwise, um, or maybe I won't play either of them. Who knows. So that's uh, that's basically it. So what what you have here again is you have these four big favorites that you want to get to, right? You have you have circuit circle. You have um, Spivak, McKinney, Ozechuk, and and Hill, right? You don't really need to get to battle. You don't really need to get to um, to McKenna, right? So you don't have to worry about that. And that's the question of what type of underdogs you want to use to get there. You know, the mid range, the mid range, we, we, we kind of went over, right? I think Edgar's a very, very strong play if you want to use somebody in the mid range there. Um, or you could play this Lipsky Cachoeira fight. That can be your mid range att attempt. And if you want to go underdogs, I think that, you know, you close your eyes and take your chances on Sato. You close your eyes, you take your chances on, on Granger. You close your eyes, you take your chances on Santos. And you close your eyes and you take your uh, take your chances on um, on Jason Witt, with Jason Witt probably being the best of them all. Um, now, oh, ooh, I forgot by the way, the other side of that fight, the, the Quinlan. Quinlan. Quinlan is obviously I forgot to mention that. I mentioned earlier, but in this in, in this in the recap, the the the, the Witt Quinlan fight is probably the key fight that you have to have. So Quinlan, I forgot to mention it was a spend up because he's only eighty six hundred. Um, so it's Witt Quinlan. Then try to get to at least one, hopefully two of those big favorites, and then you use the underdogs I mentioned to to kind of fill that out. Um, you could probably end up fading the Neil Duque fight, probably end up fading the Pagua Usman fight, probably end up fading the um, the, the the well a couple of sides, the uh, the battle side. You're going to want to fade probably. Um, I'd probably fade the Buena Silva side of that first fight. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think uh, even though it's 12 fights late, I think there's stuff that you can do here. And uh, that's it. Sorry this went longer than usual, but I thought these fights were, were uh, warranting of, of, of further discussion. Uh, that will do it. Uh, good luck, everybody.